Like Pastor Steve said, my name is Levi. I've gotten to meet many of you. Um, I've been here a few times now. It's always great to be here. Um, thank you again, Steve, for inviting me back. This is a really exciting time in the life of Church Hill. It's been so exciting uh, for me to uh, see it and um, be a part of it to some degree. Uh, really exciting. Uh, next week, the particularization service. Um, what an awesome time. And it's so encouraging for me to see you all giving yourselves to the church, to see a new church planted, to uh, see it grow, to see it flourish. Uh, that's, that's incredible. It's amazing. What we're doing here this morning is so important. It's so significant that we are gathered uh, to worship the living and the true God. And so I invite you now, please uh, turn with me to our sermon text this morning, which is in Nehemiah. And the book of Ezra and Nehemiah paint a very interesting uh, picture for us of what it looks like for God's people to gather, like we are doing here, and even to uh, build something new. And in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, these are two men that were um, leading the exiled uh, people of Judah back to their land to uh, rebuild their way of life, to rebuild their city and their temple. And, and so it's very similar to what we're doing here in the, in the, uh, the way that we're building this church. And so uh, the main theme that we wanted to look at this morning, that I want to look at this morning, is this theme of gathered worship and specifically how we can do that uh, joyfully. We know our catechism teaches us that man's chief end is to glorify God, is to, to ascribe Him glory and worship, and it's also to enjoy, enjoy Him uh, forever. And so we know not only are we to glorify God in everything that we do, but we're also called to find our deepest satisfaction and our deepest joy in Him. And I think that that last part, finding joy can often be the hardest part for us. Even in the midst of such an exciting time as a new church being planted, we can sometimes lose that joy that should accompany such a wonderful occasion. And there's a variety of reasons for that. You know, there's always things going on uh, in the country and in our society around us. The elections are always a stressful time, no matter where you might fall on uh, how things go. And so maybe uh, you're here this morning, and whether intentionally or not, you're, uh, you've become distracted by things that are going on, and maybe your heart has grown cold to the truth and the warmth of the gospel. And maybe you've already set your mind that you're just going to go through the motions this morning instead of engaging your heart. Or maybe you're here this morning something more personal. Maybe there's uh, some habitual sin or some failure that you've experienced recently, and that's weighing you down. And so you're here this morning, and you're wondering, how can I worship God with, with joy and with truth when I'm so weighed down by what's going on in my personal life? Or maybe you're here and uh, nothing of what you've done has caused this, but maybe you've faced real hardships lately. Uh, what our catechism also describes as the, the miseries in this life that are a product of a fallen world. And so maybe today has been particularly hard for you, and you're here this morning and you're praying, God, I want to worship you with joy. I want to uh, celebrate this exciting time in the church, but I just don't feel it. I don't, I don't have it this morning. I don't have that joy. Well, this is how God's people felt. This is the same situation that we see in our narrative this morning. As they were gathering in corporate worship, the people, we will read, struggled to worship God joyfully as he wanted them to do. But as they struggled, they were hit with this incredible truth that the joy of the Lord was their strength. And that changed everything. So that's our aim this morning too, that we would also be convinced of this incredible joy that we have in the Lord, that it would animate us, that it would blow us away with his goodness for us, and that it would strengthen us, that we could worship him joyfully as he wants us to do, that his joy would be our strength. 
as well. So please turn with me now. Let's uh, read our text this morning, and then we'll pray for God's blessing. I am uh, going to actually start reading back in chapter 7, at the end of chapter 7, verse 73, the second part of that verse. That part of the verse really belongs with the context of our story, and so I'll start reading there just to give us some background, but then we'll focus primarily on verses 9 through 12. Uh, so please uh, read with me now, follow along with me, uh, verse 73. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maasiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashun, Hashpadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akud, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Anan, Haliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read, they read from the book from the law of God clearly and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning, for the gifts of your word, that we can gather here as one body, as one man, to hear from your word. Lord, I pray by your spirit, would you preach a better sermon through me than I ever could, and would you make it effectual to our hearts and to our minds this morning, that we may live more and more each day to live unto righteousness, as you have called us to. Would you do that work in our hearts this morning, we pray. Amen. Well, before I uh, moved to the Richmond area, uh, I lived in the Boston area, just north of Boston, for close to six years. And for a few of those years while I was living there, I worked at a small Christian publishing house uh, called Hendrickson Publishers. Uh, it was a broadly evangelical publishing house, everything from kids' books all the way to the most uh, dry, academic, uh, put-you-to-sleep kind of materials. Um, but uh, it was broadly evangelical, and uh, all my co-workers there, they all came from a variety of different uh, Christian backgrounds and traditions, and so we always had a lot of good conversations. Uh, I'll never forget the one conversation that I had uh, as I was uh, telling them that I was planning on uh, joining the PCA and that I wanted to uh, seek ordination in the PCA. I was telling her this, I'll never forget uh, what she told me. 
She looked at me and said, Oh, you Presbyterians, you love talking about sin. Well, I don't know if she was necessarily wrong about that. I heard a few chuckles, maybe some people were nodding their heads, agreeing with that assessment. We know there is some truth to that. If we're being honest with ourselves, we do focus quite a bit on the doctrine of, doctrine of sin, the doctrine of, of total depravity, uh, but we know that's not for, for no reason. As we look around in our society all around us, or even in the church as well, we, we've lost our doctrine of who God is. And we've lost our doctrine of man. We, we don't take sin seriously enough in our culture, in our society, in our church. And the big reason why we don't is because we, we don't take uh, God's holiness enough. And so it's true, we must not ever let go of that vital biblical truth of God's holiness and, and man's sinfulness. But at the same time, and in the other hand, we must grasp onto this vital biblical truth of Christian joy. See, God is he's seeking joyful worshipers. And this is the first thing that we see in our narrative here this morning, that the people of Israel had gathered as one man to worship their great God, but we see that they became too focused on the weight of their sin, and, and they were in danger of missing out on the reason that they had gathered in the first place. To worship God in joy. Well, let's take a step back and just set the stage here. Through the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah and others, God's people, they returned from exile and they immediately set the work to do the work of rebuilding the temple and to uh, to rebuilding their city and in many ways rebuilding their entire way of life. And now at this point in the story, they get to work on rebuilding the spiritual lives. They've finished the physical work, and now they're going to start the work of covenant renewal and spiritual revival. And so we read that this event, this worship service, took place in the seventh month, it says, which would be the perfect month uh, for them to do this uh, service. Because this, this month was a very important month in the Jewish calendar. This month contains the Day of Atonement, it also contains uh, the Feast of Booze, or the Feast of Tabernacles, this week-long feast of celebration. And in modern days as well, this month, the first of the month, was, was their New Year, their New Year Day. And it's possible this was the case in this, at this point in time as well. But nevertheless, this month was supposed to be a day of celebration, a month of feasts, especially this first day, which we read is when they had gathered together. But as Ezra is reading from the Book of the Law, that's the book of Moses, the first five books in our Bible. As he's reading from these five books, he reads, he's, he's reading to them all the stories of, of their past. He's, he's reading to them the historical account of the fall in the garden. He's reading to them the stories of how their ancestors had wandered in the wilderness for their disobedience to God. And as the people are hearing these stories and they're hearing the legal material read and explained to them and, and realizing all the ways in which they themselves had disobeyed their God, it says that they wept. And I, I love this part of the story. This is such a beautiful picture of the believer's response to hearing the word of God. You know, every believer, you and me both, all of us have felt this way at some point. And continue to, as we, we hear the word faithfully preached, or as we're reading our own Bibles, or studying it ourselves, and, and the Spirit is, is taking those words, the words that He Himself inspired, He's taking those words and He's bringing them to our hearts, and He's cutting at our hearts, cutting away all the things that are dead and, and malignant within us, painfully cutting away the ways in which our hearts grow callous to the truth of the gospel, so that we might have new life in Him. And so weeping is the right response to hearing God's word. It's, it's a good, it's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a gift. I loved how it's put in, the, in our order of service this morning, the, the gift of confession. You know, this, this feeling of, uh, of weeping and, and sorrow over sin is, is a gift from God to his children. But we see that even that good thing done at the wrong time 
can still be wrong. It's fascinating. Do so you see that in the story? We see Ezra and Nehemiah, they're looking around at all the crowds who are, are weeping, and they're, they're looking at each other, turn to themselves and say, what, what's going on here? We're not supposed to be doing this. This isn't right. This is not what's, what we're supposed to be doing here. They go around and tell the people, stop weeping, stop mourning. This day is holy to the Lord your God. See, this day was a holy day. It was a joyous day. It was a day for party. It was a day for celebration. And so they were not supposed to weep. They're supposed to go and feast, to, to go eat the fat, which just means to eat the best food, that, that, that meal that you're saving for a special occasion, to drink sweet wine, that bottle of wine that's been sitting on the shelf for years. Now's the time to open that up. So yes, sorrow over sin is beautiful. It is precious to God. And there are times for it. We even see that later in Nehemiah 9. There was a time where they did gather as one a body to to mourn and confess their sins corporately, but everything at the right time. The same is true for us. You know, we, we did confess our sins and read from the ninth commandment and from God's law. And as we were reading that, it would have been wrong for us, uh, presumptuous and negligent for us to have a, a spirit of joy in that moment you know, as we're bringing our filthy rags before the righteous God. It'd be wrong for us to think anything other than sorrow for our sin. But it is equally wrong for us after, on the other side of the assurance of pardon, for us to still drag those feelings of guilt and shame and sorrow over our sin, sins that Jesus has forgiven and paid the price for with his blood. Do you believe that, church? If you are anything like me, then you might struggle with that. Struggle with that assurance of pardon. And I imagine that some of these conversations in our story might have gone that way as well. Like you're telling me that I have to go and celebrate right now? Like I was just sitting for six hours. You see, from, from the first light of the morning until midday, that is a long church service. I was sitting there the whole time here reading the word of the Lord and, and reading from the law. And I was hearing all the ways that I had sinned against God and, and transgressed his, his commandments and how my ancestors and the fathers and their fathers before that, all the way down, we have, we have been sinning against God our whole lives. And now you're telling me that I have to go and, and celebrate? I can't do that. No, God wouldn't want a horrible sinner like me to be happy. No way. So how do God's people worship him with joy? Especially when joy seems so impossible to grasp. Well, they do that and they can because we read this, that the joy of the Lord is the strength of God's people. You know, I love this. It, Ezra and Nehemiah, they're, they're not going around to the people and saying, you know, just buck up. You know, just got to make yourself be happy, Let's figure it out. No, they give them this rock-solid truth that they can take to the bank. Here is how you can be joyful. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, this short phrase is just bursting at the seams. I'm surprised it doesn't just kind of explode off the page in our Bibles when we read it. There's so much to unpack here, but... There's three things that I think really uh, stand out in this phrase, and we'll take them step by step. And the, the first thing that we notice is that this joy is a divine joy. This is the joy of the Lord. The object of the joy is Yahweh God. This joy is divine. You know, our society is growing increasingly secular and humanist. Uh, more and more, the, the self is becoming the highest good and, and the, the barometer of how we view everything around us. Our lived experience is, outweighs you know, any kind of objective truth. And as a society, we completely eclipse any, any idea or any view of the transcendent. The only thing that matters is just on this material plane, this horizontal plane here, and we've blinded ourselves of anything above. And so we're all affected. 
affected by our slave. To one degree or another, we, we've lost our view of anything that is divine. But this passage is an antidote for us. It, it inoculates us to the effect of the secular age. And it does so by, by taking our eyes out of this world and it forces them back upward that we can look back to God, to the Lord, to Yahweh, to the Almighty, the living and true God who is unchangeable in His being and His wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. All of these things are in God. He is divine. He is Yahweh. He's the living God, the great I Am. You know, what a relief, really what a relief it is, that there is a God, that this life is not all that there is, that our lives do in fact have meaning because we've been created with meaning and with a purpose in mind, with a chief end in mind, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And because we do have that purpose, because God is divine and He did create us, we can have joy. And see, that's the, the second thing about this verse, this, this passage, this phrase that jumps out, is that not only is it divine joy, but it's personal joy. Not only is our joy in God, but our joy is in our God. And see, this is what Nehemiah and Ezra had urged the people to remember. This, this is how you can go about eating and drinking and celebrating God with joy. It's because he is your God. You know, their joy came from their identification with the covenant God. They were part of the covenant community. And Yahweh was their God. They were his people. And as they participated in these feasts and in these celebrations, they were reaffirming this covenant truth. And so, too, it is with us. This world is full full of counterfeit joys. But there's only one source of true joy. That's the joy that comes from knowing God and being known by Him. That He is our God, that we are His people, that, he, that His covenant promises that He gave to His people in this book, at this time, are our covenant promises as well. That through His Spirit, we are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ. That all of our sins are pardoned. And when he looks at us, he accepts us as righteous in his sight. Not because of our own righteousness, but only for the righteousness of Christ that's been applied to us, received by faith alone. And so too are we, we're adopted, we're received into the number of the sons and daughters of God. And as sons and daughters, we're, giving, we're given a right to all the privileges that come along with that. That God is actually our Father. As Spurgeon writes, he's commenting on this, on the truth of the gospel in this verse. And I love the way that he put it. He says, for God to pity me, I can understand. For God to condescend to have mercy upon me, I can comprehend. But for him to love me, for the pure to love a sinner, for the infinitely great to love a worm, that is matchless. It's a miracle of miracles. See, that, that is our joy. That's the joy that bubbles out of this wellspring of God's immeasurable love for us. What a joy. What a joy, church, that we have this covenant God, that he is our God. And because all that is true, because the eternal God is their God, and because their God has made his covenant with them, God's people can have joy. And so it's, it's a divine joy, it's a personal joy, but we also read that it is a strong joy, that the joy of the Lord is their strength. So in what way is it a strength to God's people? You know, the word strength here can be translated as a stronghold or as a protection. And, and we know that a fortress isn't, uh, isn't built for no purpose. A stronghold is, is built to protect something. So, so in what way is, is the joy of the Lord our strength? And what is it protecting us from? You see, the joy of the Lord 
It strengthens our faith in seasons of doubt, and it assures us, it protects us of the truth of our salvation. It strengthens our faith, and it assures us of our salvation. See, this is how the people could turn from mourning to dancing, how they could turn from weeping to rejoicing. The joy of the Lord strengthened them. And that joy, as they, as they found joy celebrating the feasts that set them apart as God's people, that protected them from any doubts, from any fear that God would abandon them or forsake them. It assured them of God's saving love for them. You know, we sometimes use the phrase, uh, that person, he or she, that person is my rock. You heard that? Use that yourself. My family. My family is my rock. Well, it is no small thing that when Ezra and Nehemiah went to calm the people, they reminded them of their rock and their redeemer. That their strength was not in their own righteousness or in their own power, but rather in their God, who alone would bring them joy. So where does that leave us today? This, you know, this God, this God in our story is our God too. This, this covenant he made is our covenant too. And so how can we cultivate this joy in our lives today? In the midst of everything going on, what, what can we do, walk away from this morning, to cultivate this joy? And so I'd like to just spend our remaining time looking at a few ways that God's people can cultivate that joy. That joy. And the first way we can cultivate joy is by letting the Word shape the content and direction of our lives. If you look back at me briefly, at the beginning of chapter 8, we see that it was, it was the people themselves that gathered together and asked for the reading of the Word. Verse 1. Uh, all the people gathered as one man into the square. And they told Ezra, they are the ones that told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. It was the people who desired to hear the word preached to them. This was a, a true grassroots movement. It was a spiritual awakening, a, a desire for the word of the Lord. Do we, do we desire to hear God's word like that? It also, also describes in verse 3 that the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. You know, that is so true. What we're doing this morning, what, what you're doing this morning, this is not a passive activity, but it is active. We are all actively sitting under the word as, as we hear it come to us by the Spirit, and we are submitting to the Spirit and seeking the Spirit's guidance to, to shape our lives, to apply it to our lives. And so we see that wherever the word brought them, brought them they would go. They had resolved themselves to obey the word. And that is where they found true joy. And because God had prescribed that this day was holy to them, it didn't matter how they were feeling, but they were going to celebrate God. We see later in Nehemiah 9 that it was prescribed on the 24th day that they would, they would uh, gather in sackcloth and fasting. And so that's what they did then. Wherever the word brought them, however the word taught them, that is what they would do. And that is where our joy is found too, in complete submission to the Word of God. As we let go of our desires, as we humble ourselves to the clear teaching of Scripture, and we reject the wisdom of this world and instead seek the wisdom of God, as we tune our affections to long after Him, that is how we can cultivate and find joy. A second way that we cultivate joy is by rejoicing together. And so you notice also what is said in this assembly of people, also in verse 1, that they gathered as, as one man. They are a single, unified group of people. And in chapter 8, verse 2 as well, Ezra brought the law before the assembly, and it says that both men and women, and all who were gathered, all who could understand what they heard, they all participated. You know, that's you kids. That includes you as well. We're all a part of this together. You're not here this morning just because 
your parents want you to be here or, or are making you be here. Maybe some of you are thinking, I am only here because my parents are making me be here. But, but there's more to that, that God himself wants you to be here. These words are, are your words too. These promises are your promises. This joy is your joy as well. This celebration, this feast, this party is your party too. We also see that, that no one has an excuse to miss this party. Not only are the people to go out and eat and drink and celebrate, but they, it says they're also to send portions to anyone that had nothing prepared. No one gets to be excluded from this party. We find joy when we gather together. Well, third way we cultivate joy. This one is more difficult, uh, but it was on my heart, and especially over the past uh, few weeks. But another way that we can cultivate joy is by remembering that suffering is a privilege for God's people. Uh, think with me just briefly on these passages of Scripture. Uh, the Apostle Peter wrote in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, he says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Or as we heard earlier from the Apostle Paul in Philippians, as Paul is suffering persecution for the sake of the gospel, he writes this. He says, For it has been granted to you for that, the sake, that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. See, the exiled people of Judah in our story, they were no strangers to suffering. They had just gone through this horrible exile that extended generations, and now they just returned back. But even returning back, even in the midst of this exciting time of rebuilding, of, of church planting, of, of growth, they were met with opposition from all sides. And, and we would be naive to think that we wouldn't face such opposition as well. And on top of that, they always had the memory of exile in their minds and the, the doubt that came along with that. Could that happen to us again? Are we truly safe here? You know, they were not strong. They were not strong in themselves, not in their own numbers, not in their military power. They were completely dependent on God. But here is the good news for us this morning. And for those, that, those of us here that might be suffering or feeling joyless, is that the object of our joy, the object of our joy, is also the giver, the source of our joy. If you're one that takes notes or one to write in your Bibles, I would just pencil in the margins of this story a note that points you to Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 43. Because what's implicit in our passage this morning is, is explicit just a little bit later in this book. And I'll just read it briefly. As the people again gather to, uh, to celebrate God, it says they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with a great joy. A joy that was so loud, it says uh, the women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. That is the kind of joy that we have in our Lord. He caused joy to spring up in their hearts. We might not always feel like it, and certainly there will be times when we will not have that clearest expression of joy. But what the Word of God promises us is that He will see us through to the other side, that there will be joy, and there is joy in Him. And so one final way, and we'll conclude with this, uh, one final way that we can cultivate joy, like Peter and Paul remind us, that as we suffer, we identify with Christ, and so we can cultivate joy when we look to Jesus and look to him as the model for our joy. So we read on the same night, we read this in the Gospels, that on the same night that Jesus was betrayed, after he ate the Passover meal, 
It says that he sung a hymn. On the same night, they, they sung a hymn that same night that they would go up to the Mount of Olives, and only moments later, all of Jesus' disciples, all of his closest friends and allies, every single one of them would desert him. And one of them would even betray him that would lead him eventually to that cursed death on the cross, drinking the cup of his father's wrath. And even with that awaiting him, Jesus sung his father's praises. How could he have done that? Knowing what lies before him. It's because of the joy that we it's the joy that was set before him. Because of that joy, he was able to endure the cross and despise the shame, and now he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He is the model for our joy. As God's people, they found joy in, in celebrating this feast. We are too. We're about to celebrate a feast together. This is not uh, the, the table of Churchill Press. This is not uh, any of our tables, but this is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a simple feast. This is not a uh, exuberant or extravagant feast like in our story. It's simple bread. It's simple wine. It's not the best wine, but that's because our best is in heaven. He's already gone before, and as we eat of this bread and drink of the wine, we can be sure that he is ours and that we are his, that we belong to him. And so as, as you go about this week, Look to Jesus. What a joy. What a joy it is to know Jesus and to be known by him. And let that be our strength. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your Son, your only Son, beloved Son, that you sent on our behalf. And for the gift of this meal that we can partake of together this feast that we have, to remind us and to turn our eyes to you, our only hope and our salvation. Lord, I pray that as we go about the rest of this day and the weeks, months ahead, that we would look to you as our source of joy, that we would find joy and glorify you in our thoughts and our actions and our vocations and in all of our lives. Give us the strength to do that by your spirit, we pray. Amen.